What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of We Run This. Me. Wait, I said it right, right? Yeah, I did. I, yeah. I, got, I got so crazy. Uh, me, I'm Chris Lenati. He, He's Nick Domingo. And Nick has something to share. Dude, I have been spoiling myself with food lately. I, okay, not where I thought you were going, but go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I ran for the first time in a long time yesterday. I think it was my second or third run of the new year. Okay. And give myself the energy. Mm-hmm. I spoiled myself with a, what was it? A, a Wendy's bacon, chicken, oh. Swiss ranch, whatever sandwich and French fries. And I know all the runners out there are going to be like, dude, you're not supposed to do that. Oh, I did it. And it was well fucking worth it, man. Not, not I, just, I, I rediscovered how good Wendy's is yesterday. Not only was I not thinking you were going with food here, like when you said you treated yourself, I was gonna. I was expecting some like Dairy Queen fribble, some insane. It's because you've been talking about candy for the last month and a half. I so mean, I I'm expected a heart. Yeah, so I expected some like crazy concoction like that, and you hit me with a burger from yeah. Wendy's. Well, speaking of burn, my chest was burning the entire. Well, my stomach was burning the entire time I ran yesterday, what? and from- even three hours, four hours after I ate the thing, I felt like I was gonna vomit. Wait, but walk, it was walk me through. Walk me through the order. You ran, then ate it, or ate it? No, 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 no. I I ate it, and then I, I was like, "All right, I need to let this digest." It was really nice out here in Seattle yesterday. Sunny, fifty something degrees. Like I have to get a run in before you know the sun goes down. So I ate like two o'clock, about four fifteen, four thirty. I'm like, I'm gonna go for this run, and yeah, two and a half, three hours after I ate this thing, my body was like, "Dude, don't ever do this again." Don't yeah. like you're you can't get away with it like you used to. No, no. I th- I thought that was like your reward for running. No, no, no. It was supposed to give me my energy to run, which it, I guess it did, but who I paid the price. And here I am. I'm eating oatmeal packets, and you're like, Yeah, I had this triple cheeseburger from Wendy's. Why that one? Well, I actually I had ordered a chicken sandwich. And then I kept looking at the menu and she's, you know, reading back what you do. Like I always get it without tomato. So I'm like looking at it and like, all right, the screen's right. And I was like, oh shit, actually, can I change it up to this one? She's like, you sure? I was like, yeah, change it to a number eight rather than number two. And I, yeah, I, it just sounded good, man. A spicy chicken, bacon, ranch, whatever. Go get one. Go I'm just, get one. I'm just laughing how you're getting an awful sandwich and you take off the one lone healthy thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, fuck yeah. that tomato. <laughs> Dude, I'm, I'm, not, I'm going off the deep end, you know? <laughs> I'm, if I'm doing it, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm eating my shit. Okay, so this is my problem with stuff like that. And let's see if you have the same problem. So once I have that, and once I know, now I always want it. I, I'm similar to that, but I always, it gave me a reason to run yesterday. I was, I was like busy. I knew that I wanted to get a run in before the sunset. And I said to myself, Nick, if you have this for lunch, you're either going to be sluggish and sit around and be a piece of shit or you're going to do it. And this would be your motivation to be like, all right, this is your reward. Now you have to go run. And I, I, I needed that because if I would have had like a salad or something, I'm like, all right, I don't really need to run, but I'm glad I did. It was, it was amazing. It felt great. My body's not too sore, so uh, you know, trying to mix more runs in with my bike rides now. Okay, well, good luck with your fast food diet. <laughs> yeah, next and- next next week's episode, I'll be five hundred pounds. <laughs> yeah. You're like, so I had four in a row, and then I tried to run up my steps, and I didn't make it. So yeah, I ordered another. <laughs> so I just gave up and had another one. Yeah, so here I am. <laughs> we round this anyway. Yeah, exactly. So our guest today is uh, Kaylee Gilcrest. She is a an Olympic hopeful and a former Olympian. She won Olympic gold in water polo. She, uh, she's an insane um, surfer. Uh, just I guess some people are just made. She's one of the people that are just made for the water. You know what I mean? I, you know, not even just water. I, I think yes, she's a water baby. You know, USC girl. Sounds like she grew up in California. You know, that that's a different lifestyle, I think, than you and I can can relate to yeah. being in, you know, Jersey and myself, Ohio, Tennessee, Seattle, whatever. But she's just like an athlete. You know, one of those kids like you're in high school and you're like, that girl can do 
everything and she's good at every sport Mm -hmm. that's Kaylee like she seems like she just kicks ass literally at anything she does yeah I mean she was surfing at eight like competitively surfing in her teens or before that then water polo Olympic I mean she comes from Olympic blood so that kind of helps yeah so um I think that's already like a natural genetic kind of thing that helps it's kind of like you know when you see like you look at a Patrick Mahomes or, or like that you're like okay well they have a actual athlete the Mannings like they have literal athletes littered throughout their family. So it kind of makes it easier. So, um, I mean, like, yeah, like you said, like a, an insane athlete, all around cool girl, woman, I should say, not really a girl. And uh, I was super jealous because not only uh, is she an Olympian, she's going to the chiropractor today. And that's what I really focused on. <laughs> Nick, I, love I, I love that that's what you focus on. I, I, I also love that she's got a gold medal that she doesn't really care about. And you're talking to an Olympian and you're like, that's cool and all, but... I mean, she cares about it. She just doesn't care about where it is at the moment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you understand, like, I used to go to the chiropractor. Then they got a little bit, little bit too pricey. Like, it was, like, out of network. It was, like, $35, $40 a time. Which, like, you know, I'm supposed to do. Like, it's one of those things I'm supposed to do. But, like, when I get to hear that people are going, I'm just kind of like, oh. Chiropractor to me is like when some people say they're going for a massage. Like, you know, the reaction when people hear the massage, they're like, oh, you're so like, don't get me wrong, I like massages. But like when uh, people say they're going to the chiropractor, and I just imagine the, the neck, it's the neck. Like, I'm obsessed with people. Like, if someone told me they knew how to crack a neck, I might believe them and let them do it. So, all you single ladies out there, if you know how to crack necks, Hit up Chris Illuminati. Yes, please do. Actually, I made a joke today uh, to a friend of mine um, because I'm doing a lot more stuff on like TikTok and, and Instagram with videos and stuff like that. I said that I was going to tweet out. Uh, I wouldn't really say I'm looking for a girlfriend, but I wouldn't mind having a live-in videographer because <laughs> <laughs> I need someone to hold the camera for me. That's that's probably the worst. That that probably be the worst uh, worst and best Tinder bio ever. Yeah, exactly. What's your payment? I mean, it's kind of like a date, I guess. Yeah. Like, I'll, I'll Netflix and chill with you. So, yeah. all the ladies out there, Chris yeah. is, he is actively looking. You for come help, over. Professional <laughs> and personal help. Definitely, definitely professional. You come over, I'll make dinner, and then you hold the camera while I do dumb Lego videos. Exactly. <laughs> dumb TikToks while I yeah. dance. Yeah. So. All right, so uh, here's uh, Nick and I talking. Wow, that really went off the deep end. <laughs> here's Nick and I talking to Kaylee. What's up, everybody? We're back, and we are here with Kaylee Gilchrist. And Kaylee, I mean... You have a hard stop in 40 minutes because you're, quote unquote, trying to make an Olympic team. I mean, <laughs> if anybody's trying to show off. <laughs> just, you know, just trying to train, trying to get better and hopefully be in Tokyo. OK, so what happens in 40 minutes? What do you have to what, uh, what do? You- so 40 minutes, we, we practice at 1.30, practice begins, but we do recovery and treatment in between practices. Um, so I have chiropractor at like 12.45. Okay, so let me ask this. You're at an Olympic level right now. Nick and I are not at an Olympic level, but here's something that I want to know. Uh, Do you get shit for being late? Oh, you can't be late. What happens? Yeah, what's punishment? (laughs) Everyone knows that you can't be late, so it rarely happens, but when it does, depending on that person and their tendencies, we go into a kangaroo court and get to decide what the punishment is. So coaches don't even get involved. Are you guys like... no. Yeah. Usually it's so rare that usually that person has enough anxiety of being late that that's punishment enough. Got it. Are you guys on one of those, like, if you're on time, you're late kind of schedules where like be here at 3 PM. But if you're at 3 PM, you're late, you have to actually be here at like 2 55. Yeah. And like, is the process going? Oh, for sure. Like if you practices start at 7 AM and one thirty, like you're walking in 10 minutes early. Okay. But yeah. Has, has anyone that you've ever seen, or maybe yourself done this, have you, well, first of all, have you ever been late? Um, I have been, I have been late once or twice. Okay. Have you done the thing? Cause this is something I would do if I was late and I knew it, like I would already punish myself before anybody could ever do anything to me. <laughs> well, I think again, like just the anxiety and the stress of being late, 
is punishment enough and as long as it's not like a normal habit of yours then usually you get off scotch free so one or two times late in my you know six years of coming here then usually the my teammates and coaches let let it slide okay that's good i mean we're not going to make you late but (laughs) (laughs) we'll make sure you're on time and you're actually early because we don't want to go to kangaroos court and make you you know be responsible for you having to do like more laps and and more work yeah You've Perfect. already done, you already do a lot of that on your own time, so. Yeah, we do too much of that already. Exactly. So what, so what does this afternoon's practice like entail? What are you going to be doing? So in the mornings, there's more conditioning. We do weights, about two hours of weights, and then you're in the pool for an hour and a half of, you know, more drills and skills. And then afternoon training are more polo based. So we'll still do some drills and warm up past the normal, but then we'll start playing a little bit more uh, polo scrimmaging type and it progresses throughout the week. So we're on a Thursday. So we'll be playing more than, than we did on a Monday or Tuesday in the afternoon. Can you talk about the endurance of just being in the pool for that long and, and you know, how you're mixing what, what you're doing in the water, as opposed to the training that you do, you know, just day to day outside of the pool. Yeah. I mean, the sport, asks a lot of you you know obviously you have to be in great swimming shape but there's a wrestling aspect that a lot of people don't know about water polo so that's where the importance of of the gym and and strength and conditioning outside of the water comes in so right now we're on um four days a week two hours outside of the pool of that strength and conditioning program a lot of olympic lifts a lot of movement stretching all that and then you know we're in the pool at least four or five hours a day. So the demands is super high and you just got to be in in that water polo shape. And that's something that's tough because um, you can lose water polo shape in a week. And it's something that takes like six weeks to gain. And then if you're out of the pool for a week, you just lose it like that. So it's, it's a little bit uh, annoying in that sense, but definitely um, worth it. And that's why we train that much as, as we do. Have you lost that shape? I mean, you know, as someone who's obviously not an Olympic athlete, you know, I can go two weeks and I can tell a major difference when I'm biking or running from where I was to where I am and getting back into it. So what's that struggle like if you have fallen out of shape to get back up and play catch up, whether it's after an injury or just a couple weeks off? Yeah, it's really tough. Um, we rarely have a couple weeks off, but when we do, there's always like our coach in the back of our mind being like, you got to stay in shape, like you got to swim, got to run. Um, but I think like the higher you become in sport, the more aware you become of your body. So our two weeks of losing shape might not look like the everyday's two weeks because people would still assume or think that we're in shape or we look like we're in shape, but we can feel it immediately in the water. Even after training trips, we usually get two, maybe three days off if we're lucky, but just with the travel and, and the lack of sleep and everything that comes with that, you know, going from different time zones and whatnot on top of having a couple of days off, like that first practice back is tough. Let's actually talk about, you mentioned the running. Let's talk about, do you do a lot of running? Do you like running? How do you feel about it? Um, I like it in my off season, you know, during quarantine when all the pools were closed, I I was definitely running a little bit more. Um, We will add running depending on where we are in our strength and conditioning program. We'll add certain sprints or maybe miles per time. Um, But we don't use running as an everyday training just because of the demands uh, that we are asked of the pool for our bodies. Um, But I've always enjoyed running, done a half marathon here or there, and think I'm I'm done with that. No marathons (laughs) are planned, but I I could see myself once water polo is over running a little bit more. Well, go ahead, Grace. Uh, well, I was going to say, so Nick and I, we are runners. And the good thing about what we do is like, literally we could do it anywhere. You have a very specialized sport where you can't just always just find a pool. Like, how do you work that around your schedule and travel and things like that? Yeah. I mean, that's been the biggest challenge during quarantine. You know, uh, we, we got back in the pool June 1st, but I think we shut down March, I want to say 20th of 2020. So for many of us, it was the longest time we've ever been without being in a pool. And instead of having anxiety and whatnot, it was like, okay, this is a time where it's okay to not be in the pool and not be training. This is a time to figure out what other uh, ways we like to stay fit, whether it's running, yoga, Pilates, um, you know, home circuits. And it, it kind of felt hindsight, like it was nice to, to let your body rest. Um, 
But fortunately, now that we're training, we have our pool six days a week. You know, we have our times, you know, six hours a day. And then I'm fortunate to have a club in Newport where I can swim at as well. So um, when you're, I think, at our level, you can find ways and find pools to, to keep swimming. You just flash a gold medal when you walk by a pool and be like, yo, I need to get in here, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, one, let's talk Olympics. You, you kind of mentioned it, you know, pool shut down March of last year. There was still a lot of uncertainty. Obviously, the Olympics has gotten rescheduled to, to this year. Um, where's your mindset at right now? I mean, not only that break last year when the pool shut down, but right now, still some uncertainty about Tokyo and, and if the games are going to go on. Yeah, I mean, I think right now, I don't want to talk for the entire team, but at least for me and what feels like a majority of the team is our mindsets. Uh, in a place that it hasn't been in a long time for the better. You know, I think everyone is fired up and we can kind of see this, this light at the end of the tunnel. And for so many months, we had no idea what was going to happen. We had no idea when we were going to be able to start playing water polo. You know, we were doing non-contact swimming practices and it was just getting monotonous. And it's not the way we like to train. We like to have intensity and we like to have fun playing the sport that we all love. You know, we, we chose to be water polo players, not swimmers. And now that we've got, you know, hopefully a little bit more confidence in the Tokyo games, we still don't know what it's going to look like, but I think for most of us, we're confident it's going to happen. Um, and then we do have some competition on our calendar as well. That just gets us fired up. Um, it is tough being at Los Alamitos, which is where we train at, at the training base and only competing against ourselves. Um, so we're, we're really hoping we get some competition over here pretty soon so we can start beating up on other opponents. Okay, so just a minute ago, you said, you know, you got into it, you're water polo players, you're not swimmers. There's a little animosity when you said, we're not swimmers. <laughs> is there like a beef with swimmers? Is there is like a little rivalry or something? No, no beef. Um, but we just think <laughs> swimming is obviously we have to do it often. And we, we have hard swim sets and whatnot. But we just think it's a little boring. You know, you're just staring at a black line nonstop and couldn't imagine that being your entire sport you know my, my dad was an olympic swimmer so uh no beef against the swimmers but i'm just glad that we have a little bit more of the teamwork and team aspect in water polo so is that one reason why i know you kind of laughed after doing the half marathon you mentioned it earlier and you're like never going to do that again like i got it out of my system yeah. is that part of the reason why you are in water polo and not swimming or a professional runner because it is kind of just like all right, we're going. And there's not the, the constant movement or different element that you have in polo. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I, you know, I started playing at eight, fell in love with it basically around the same time I started playing. And I was just a, a tomboy growing up and loved all sports, all team sports. Like I was flag football, basketball, you know, water polo and whatnot. So I think that I just attracted to team sports and then once you're kind of hooked that's that's all that's all I did so I really don't know anything else than team sports so you're the first we've talked to a couple Olympians but you're the first Olympian that we've ever talked to whose parent was also an Olympian so walk us through is that a little bit more pressure or does he actually help because he's gone through that experience before yeah, I mean, my dad and my uh, relationship is actually pretty unique in the sense that I never really felt pushed by him. Um, he would want to give me tips and stuff, but as a little, you know, 12-year-old kid, the last thing you want to do is listen to your parent. Mm -hmm. And looking at hindsight, I probably should have because, ironically, I'm one of the worst swimmers on the team. <laughs> but um, I don't think it was until I was a little bit older and almost following in his footsteps where I realized how awesome it was that he was an Olympian. And kind of that respect that I had for him after going through my own journey and knowing what it takes to, to get to the top. Um, so it wasn't until like probably high school when I realized it was that cool. And then I went to USC and he also swam at USC. So the relationship has been really fun sharing stories of, of both of our own separate journeys and kind of comparing and contrasting one another. And something that's really cool is my, my dad's first games it was 1964 and that was held in Tokyo. So to be able to go to Tokyo, if I make the team and hopefully fans will be able to come, but it'll just be, regardless if fans are there or not, it'll just be a really special moment for our entire family. That's awesome. Are, do you have a little bit of concern uh, about the potential with Tokyo, regardless of fans being there, 
but also, you know, you mentioned it, like your support system is, would be your, your dad, your parents, your family, your friends, they probably won't be able to go. So how does that look in your mind to really be just the team aspect, like the bonding, if you guys, you know, you, you make the team and get to Tokyo to be like, this is just us. It's like a free for all for our own team. There's not that support system outside of that. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a strong reality that's going to happen. And our, our coach touched upon it and he realized, he just basically said, you know, like it's, it's a, easy to get excited when you're at Olympic games to play for to play a game no matter how tired you are when you just look up the stands are packed and your family's in the stands like we got to find a way that we get that excited when we just look around at each other because that's probably what's going to happen and it's we practice every day with each other so we just need to make sure that the bonds and connections that we create are even stronger than they've ever been before because we're not going to have that extra push or extra push of adrenaline down there Um, and I, I'm fortunate I've thought about it and I, you know, I'm leaning more to the fact that fans and spectators probably won't be able to go. And that just makes me that much more grateful for my experience in Rio and having all my friends and family down there. And luckily I was able to have that once. And now I have a different mission and a different, um, reason why I'm doing that and doing it this go around. And and that's for the team. So uh, really quick, sorry, Chris, I, I, along those lines, because, I, you know, I've been watching NBA games, NFL games, and like I, a lot of people, myself included, have to listen to like music while we run. We, a lot of people listen to like hardcore music when they lift, and that's that's kind of their fans, right? It's so unique that an Olympic athlete, uh, uh, athlete at your level, or basketball players, football players can do that. How do you guys do that? Like, I, I just, it's amazing to me that these that you guys are able to just go into an arena, go into a pool, go into a stadium completely empty and just have that geeked up energy to, to go perform at the highest level. Like get me into your mindset a little bit when you're doing that. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a few ways you can look at it. I mean, in all honesty, women's water polo isn't the biggest sport out there. So we travel to Siberia, to China, to these crazy places that most of the time our parents aren't too excited to go and we're not getting a big fan base. So we're almost used to having tournaments in a small fan setting. So we're used to having to get that, that pump up or the fired up within one another. So during war up, well, yeah, we listen to music and whatnot, but we get pumped up for each other. And I think that's something that's going to set us up for success in Tokyo. And also now that through COVID and through the postponement and everything that, you know, personally I've had to go through and that the teams had to go through this entire quad, um, the mo- motivation's higher. So I think it'll be a lot easier to find that motivation during those quiet, dull times in the arenas. Um, you know, we're, like I said, even before, we're just itching to get competition. And I know when competition comes, we're just going to be so excited to finally play uh, with each other instead of against each other like we do every day in practice. So speaking of motivation, uh, you had a relationship with possibly one of the most motivational people to ever walk the planet in Kobe Bryant. Uh, yeah. do you want to walk us through how that developed and some of the things you learned from him? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I grew up, I was born in 92 in Newport. So if you were born around that time, you were obsessed with the Lakers and Kobe Bryant, mm-hmm. uh, watched him bring a bunch of titles to LA. And like I said before, basketball was my, my first love, uh, before water polo. So I dreamt of going to the WNBA before I dreamt of going to the Olympics for water polo. And, um, uh, as I progressed in sport, I started rather than just the basketball aspect of Kobe, I started to really enjoy his, the Mamba mentality and his mindset. And I would listen to his, you know, his muse or his interviews, videos of him talking more so than him actually playing the game. And then um, back in 2017, I had the opportunity to meet him just randomly. I was at that same club I, I mentioned where I swim laps and I was just going for a little workout and I noticed Kobe was there. So I waited and then went and tr- introduced myself. I was like, hey, Mr. Bryant, my name's Kaylee Gilchrist. I wore number 10 representing Team USA like you did. And then he was just like, so cool. He's like, oh, no way. Water polo? Like, yeah, we watched you. Like, we watched you win gold. And he introduced me to his daughter because he was coaching his daughter's basketball team. So that was really cool. And then I went home and tweeted a photo of us. And he followed me back on Twitter. And I was just like a kid in the candy store. <laughs> few years later, it's probably 2019. I also um, am a 
on the USA surf team committee and we did something at the mama sports Academy. So again, I got to meet him and I went and I was like, he's not going to remember me. So I went to introduce myself. He's like, what are you doing with a handshake? Like bear hugged me, <laughs> said, what's up, checked in on me, which was really cool. And then, you know, I, I was psyched on that. Wanted to reach out to him somehow, some way just to pick his brain, but never had the opportunity until in 2019 July after we won world championships in South Korea we were out celebrating and the balcony collapsed and I got severely injured um actually had to undergo surgery in South Korea and uh super scary time fortunately we all made it out okay there was a two uh two South Koreans that passed away actually and I um woke up from surgery and they said I was millimeters away from my nerve so that was just you know I knew a full recovery was possible I didn't know how long it was going to take so when I was flying home from South Korea, I reached out to him over Twitter and on a message and, and he got right back to me. He's like, I, I was watching you on the news. I swear I was going to reach out. Like I'll keep checking in. And then, so we just shot Twitter message back and forth. And I started picking his brain about how he's overcome adversity and injuries. And he gave me some contacts of his to help me out. And it just became this little mentorship, whether he knew it or not, you know, I, I just considered him a part of my team and our trainer, who knew all of this uh, called my comeback, the Mamba mission. So when he passed, obviously, you know, a lot of, a lot of trauma and uh, emotions came up from the injury that I was clearly putting aside, but it also just made the Mamba mission that much more important. That, I mean, I'm like, you probably can't tell I'm holding back, like crying right now. I mean, I'm a huge Jordan Kobe guy. I grew up, you know, I'm a little bit older than you. So Jordan, was kind of that guy for me to kind of then pass the torch to Kobe. And so hearing that story and hearing that you had that relationship and how uh, receptive he was to, to, to be there, how are you continuing to live that, you know, quote unquote, mama mentality? Uh, and, and, and not just in sport, but literally every single day, maybe just taking a breath, slowing down and being like, you got this. Like on those shitty days where you're like, you know, I didn't perform at this level or something comes up that, that those lessons that you, you learn from him, just having that relationship. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting because I, after my injury, I became just obsessed with my physical recovery and I was putting in these insane hours. And I thought at the time, that's what I need. And that's probably what I did need for the most part to get back to hopefully make the Olympics. But I realized once he passed, um, all the emotions, like I mentioned, came back up and I actually dealt with some panic attacks that I've never dealt with before. And then I sought out therapy and started working on the mental aspect that I was clearly pushing away. So I think at the time I thought the Mamba mentality was just obsessing over your craft to get better. But once he passed and once these stories come out of him helping so many people just like me, like, how does this guy have enough time to be, to reach out? And it's almost like his next chapter was leaving a legacy to other people. And I think that's helped me with balance. You know, obviously I want to be the best water polo player I can be and put in the hours and be completely present in my training and still do the extra work that has gotten me here. But I also think that it's led me to the importance of giving that same effort to every aspect of your life, whether it's your family, your passions, you know, water polo and just, um, really being present and curious and to continuing bettering, bettering yourself in, in everyday life. Walk us through your day-to-day -day mentality about, you know, the way you got injured as an athlete, as a high level athlete, you constantly walk out there and go, I could be hurt at any time. And you just accept that. But when you get hurt, a freak accident, like a, something collapsing, like how does that change your day-to-day -day life is like, oh God, I better not take this different street. Cause if I do, that might be the way I get in an accident or I better not do this thing that I don't always do. Like, how do you manage that? Yeah. I mean, that's there. I think it's most present in um, like, I get really more claustrophobic now. So I'll try to avoid certain things that remind me of that incident or, or put me in like a claustrophobic area. But part of therapy is, is overcoming that. Um, so there's been plenty of challenges in that, but I think it's more so of not living afraid. Like it's, it's even living with more purpose and passion because it was almost taken away from me. Um, you know, so give it all obviously in sport, but also like go surf when it's pumping and don't worry about getting too tired. Like go hang out with your friends if you can, or hang out and give time to your, to your family instead of worrying about getting injured in that way and worrying about, you know, not taking the right, the right street or whatnot. Cause you can't, you can't live in fear.
Now you actually, you know, you mentioned the teams at sport that you, you kind of gravitated towards as a young kid, but you also got into surfing, you know, early as well. If you, and you said you wanted to try and be in the WNBA. So like, let's just go down the line right now. You've got water polo, you've got surfing and you've got basketball. Where does it fall in the rank of those three of your, your ultimate love? And I don't want to get you in trouble. I don't, I hope you say water polo one, but like, if you don't, I hope that you're not, your coach isn't listening and being like, yo, Kaylee, like, what are you doing? <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely water polo and surfing for different reasons. Like surfing is a thing that you can go and do, jump in the ocean, catch three waves, and you're already in a better mood. Water polo is harder to love day, day by day, but the long-term effects is something indescribable. You know, the connections with teammates, lifelong friendships, the memories traveling around the world, you know, not so much the games, obviously those are great, but it's like the hungover bus rides after a night out that you all laugh about the stories that happened that night. You know, those are the things that, that make the sport and the group of people so important. And, um, you know, surfing has that too, but it's a little bit different when it's an individual sport rather than, you know, a bunch of people coming together for, for a common goal. So surfing every day and then water polo, I think like lifelong, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you still play hoops? Uh, yeah. Well, we'll, I don't play like games or pickup games, but definitely play a game of force every once in a while. Nice. So, so we've talked to other Olympians before and, and like high level athletes and all of them will talk about their successes, but they all will admit that they get really hung up on the losses. So is there anything sticking out that are out there that you're just like, Ugh, I don't think I'm ever going to get over that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's, there's plenty of surfing losses. Surfing's always tough, but I mean, the distinct water polo losses that stick out are two CIF finals. So it's like high school championship, my senior year, we we're up by five goals going into the second half and lost. And then again, lost the national championship in college in the finals by two. And th those two stick out to me. And I don't know where, where it began, but I like have this rage inside of me when I lose. And I think that's probably similar to many athletes, but I do the best to hide it. Like no one really know, I'll, like smile, high five the other team, give good job, like say good job and all that. And then like get back to the hotel room and just go run on the treadmill for 45 <laughs> minutes to like get out the rage and to really like digest the loss and learn of what I did wrong and what I could do better. But that's kind of been my way to mentally get over those tough losses. And they, they still hurt. I mean, I graduated high school 11 years ago and I feel like it was just yesterday when we lost that game. Do, do you ever break anything? No, I've done a couple punches into the wall and got a couple bloody, bloody knuckles, but. Oh, you're not. No, you can't punch. Don't punch wall. People always make that mistake. Like, they think it's cool. They see it in movies. Like they want their hand to go through the drywall. Like you can hit a stud. Like don't go, if you're going to do that, like, yeah, don't, don't go for walls. Everyone makes that mistake. Don't go for walls. <laughs> that's only happened a couple of times. So hopefully that's not going to be happening <laughs> anymore in my career. You need to line up glasses and then just take a water polo ball and just <laughs> chuck it at those. That's I think probably the best method. So you don't get hurt. You can still take <laughs> the frustration out, break some stuff. There you go. So one of the things that I always find amazing about athletes and, and successful athletes, you mentioned Kobe, another story, obviously Tom Brady that came out this week was like one of his Buccaneers teammates, he was crying for making the Super Bowl after winning the NFC championship game. And, and Brady looked at him and was like, dude, why the hell are you crying? Like the job's not done yet. You've obviously won some gold medals. You've been to the Olympics. How do you continue to stay hungry because that is something you know I always I joke about this Kobe gene it's Kobe got one and then he got three with Shaq and then he stayed hungry and was like I need to get one on my own and then I need to get another one to validate it and then I'm close enough to Jordan to try and get another one so yeah. with you where do you get that that motivation to continue to push yourself and not get complacent when you already have so much success yeah I mean it's, I think, an addicting feeling, you know, being on the top and you, it's such an exhilarating feeling that you always want, want that and you want to want it more and more and more. And also, so we're striving to reach that, but also what comes in between that, I think is also addicting the routine, the grind, you know, pushing yourself to become the best, 
we're at a, we're at a place where we'll probably never be pushed like this again. Um, and I think we kind of thrive under, under that, those circumstances and under the pressure. And, you know, I thought I was actually going to be done with water polo in 2016 after Rio. And I took a year off just to surf and I realized I was missing something and, and that something was the team and the sport and, and the grind. And, um, I think that's why a lot of athletes struggle in retirement because they're trying to seek that feeling that's so hard to, to come by. When we talk to other people on the podcast, uh, we always like to ask about unwritten rules, like for their sport or for their team. And I'll give an example of one. So we talked to a lot of runners and a lot of them have said one big unwritten rule for them is don't be a one upper. So if someone asks you to go on a run, don't run one step ahead, run with them. So what are some like unwritten rules of water polo? Water polo. Um, I mean, there's a million for surfing, but for water polo, I feel like if you're going to go kind of the one upper, if you're going to go second in the swimming, then make sure you give enough space to that person going first um, in the, in the team room or in the weight room. Don't try to like power through sets, make sure you give your space and time to the person in front of you. Um, I think just a lot of awareness type things, like make sure, you know, your spatial awareness, mm -hmm. don't be all up in somebody's area. Mm. All right. So give us some unwritten rules of surfing. Surfing. It's like, you can immediately tell people are kooks if they're holding their surfboard the wrong way. You want <laughs> fins in and in the back. So if anyone's holding their fins forward or on their head, or if their leash is wrapped, you know, they're like immediately a kook. <laughs> If they wear bathing suits under their wetsuits, kook. <laughs> How would that even work? I don't even think that would fit. I know. <laughs> and there's just certain things like that. Like if you're wearing colored zinc, you're probably a kook. <laughs> I like the everything you just described would be Chris and me when we go. <laughs> I've always. <laughs> so, so I was going to ask that because I've always wanted to surf, except I feel like I'm well past the point mentally where I can try. Because if I get out there, my mind's going to go, you are too fucking old for this. <laughs> go back. You can, you know, it's all right. No one's going to see you. So is there like a mental age that a person shouldn't try surfing? No, it's like, if you know you're a kook and you own it, like people will also be okay. Like if you go to a beginner spot and actually try and like learn the rules of the ocean and learn what to do and what not to do, then you're accepted no matter how old you are. It's like those people that just try to, do it on their own and don't know what they are doing and and you know they burn you or get in front of you that's when you frustrate surfers so mm. you still you still can do it <laughs> all right and speaking of are you i mean you're at a level now in a lot of sports where you can obviously help and teach other people so like say chris and i are going out there and we're the quote unquote kooks that you're talking about <laughs> and you can tell that we're like super frustrated we're, we're getting up on the board for like two seconds falling off um are you gonna sit there if you see us like on shore and be like look you know dude this is what you might be doing wrong like i noticed that you keep falling off or you're not getting up for a long time are you openly gonna do that or are you just gonna sit back and be like let's just watch these two jackasses <laughs> keep falling and, and and burn themselves the entire day i think it depends like if the waves are firing i'm not giving time to you guys to miss good waves <laughs> but also, depending on where we're like if, if you're surfing uh 54th street is like a notorious spot in newport for a little bit more of high performance surfing so if you guys come out at 54th street doing that then like i don't know if i'm gonna help you but if you go to the beginner spot of newport which is blackies and the waves are kind of mellow and small like then then I'll, I'll give you guys a tip here or there have you ever gone out there like and you know everyone thinks that you don't know what you're doing but you really do yeah, I mean, it, especially when you surf places that you don't normally surf. Like if I'm on a water polo trip in Hawaii, I usually try to borrow somebody's board and catch some waves. So I'm not on my high performance short board. You know, I'm a chick in the lineup, like using borrowed equipment. Everyone probably thinks I'm a kook and then I can stand up and actually do some turns. And they're like, mm -hmm. okay, you can like see everyone like, oh, hey, what's up? Like start talking mm -hmm. to me a little bit more and being nice. So just have to just proving grounds everywhere you go. Got it. By the way, I want to admit right now, I'm wearing a bathing suit under my sweatpants and I'm not even going swimming today. So. <laughs> <laughs> just, I mean, just, I'm wearing a beanie indoors. But I guess yeah. both you and I are very strange. It's just the way I roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, can we show <laughs> Yeah, I just, like, I just like to be prepared in case I come across a pool, I have my bathing suit on. <laughs> <laughs> All 
<laughs> so Kaylee, if you were giving someone like Chris and I some cool stories about being at the Olympics, because we'll never ever be an Olympian ourselves, what would one that you know you can look back on and be like, this is the coolest thing that ever happened to me when you were at Rio? I think um I think the opening ceremonies, which is it's really cool. I mean, it's an exhausting night. I mean, trying to herd 12,000 athletes like sheep is insane. Mm -hmm. But you go and you're with Team USA and there's no such thing as individual sports or amazing athletes. You know, you're there as a full team, which we don't get to do often because the demands of for every individual sport is so hard. So it's the first time we finally feel like a team. And you know, we're taking photos with Kevin Durant. We're taking photos with Simone Biles and Serena and everyone's being cool because everyone's at the same level. Um, and then you're going into, from it was a Markinaw Stadium, which is like a famous soccer stadium down in, in Rio. And you're in a tunnel before you come out and everyone just started chanting USA. So there's 600 plus American athletes just screaming USA before walking out and opening ceremonies. And I, I, I still get chills thinking about it, but it was like the first realization was like, holy crap, like my dream came true. Like I am officially an Olympian and you're just around everyone that has trained so many years to get to this place, but somehow everyone let their walls down for that evening like for the few hours people were just giddy little kids were running around chit-chatting with with everyone and um people had the biggest competitions of their lives the next couple days or couple weeks and they were still able to enjoy that moment and for me that was the coolest coolest moment of um the olympic games obviously minus winning a gold medal but just being together as team usa you know i felt very proud to be an american and very proud of all the work that me and my team did to get there that's awesome. And it's also that you said that and not winning the, I would have said gold medal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just like that. I would have been like, fucking gold medal. What are you talking about? <laughs> but yeah, it's good. That was <laughs> yeah, yeah. Speaking uh, of, where do, you, where do you keep your gold medal? My gold medal is in my sock drawer wrapped up in a sock. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think I've been I think wearing this shit like for years. I, I literally would be like, walk into the coffee shop and they'd be like, that'd be $4 and 50 cents. I'd be like, Oh, will it? <laughs> like, how do you not I, gloat more about this? I pulled that card for like two weeks to get free stuff in my hometown. And then, I mean, we come from such a humble sport and humble upbringing. I was like, okay, I've pulled the gold card too much. Like it's going in the sock drawer for years until I can get another one. <laughs> I, I would at least, I would at least run down to like Michael's crafts and get a frame. <laughs> is it a nice sock like is it a wolf sock what is it american sock so it's like an american flag sock so i thought that was right oh well that's fair that's normal yeah yeah, yeah kaylee that's what we would call a kook i don't know <laughs> you know that uh, that, that kook keeps your metal in a sock <laughs> you're catching on <laughs> yeah so uh before we let you go tell people where they can find you online tell them about the website tell them everything yeah, websites, KayleeGilchrist.com. I'm on Instagram at Kaylee Gilchrist, and then also Twitter, KateGilchrist15. And you said right now you're going to the chiropractor? Yeah, we get, we're a little spoiled. We get the chiropractor to come to the pool. So we just kind of rotate through the chiropractor, and then it's, it's pool time. Are they going to do the neck? Oh, they do, yeah. Oh, God. Do, do, the they do, do, they yeah. do, the, do they do the Y strap where they pull you? Yeah. Oh, God, I'm so envious. Yeah, I know. How does that feel? It feels so good. We're getting our butts kicked. We're in a pretty intense training segment right now. So we're all hurting. So we're looking forward to the Cairo. Nick, have you ever seen those, the Y strap? No, but I mean, she's making me want to become an Olympian. If this so is basically, her. I I mean, watch, all right, I'm about to admit something crazy. I watch these videos on YouTube all the time. So basically, just, facts. I want them. Yes. Like I'm addicted to that, but I just want, so the Y strap is they basically lie you down. And it looks like a Y, this strap, that it straps to your neck. And then they're just like one, two, three, and they pull. And your whole body just like expands. Like you I mean, feel like all the way like Yeah, I, I want one of those. You're so lucky. <laughs> I like how you're an Olympian and I'm like, oh my God, you're going to get your neck cracked. You are so lucky. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I get it every single day, dude. It's, <laughs> it's not, not a big deal. <laughs> yeah. I might be an Olympian just to get the neck cracks. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, Kaylee... Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. Uh, amazing stories. And we wish you, honestly, the best of luck moving forward. 
you know, focus and, and hopefully Tokyo happens and, and you're coming back with another gold medal. So you get a couple weeks to gloat a little bit more. <laughs> Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Uh, best of luck to both of you. And that brings another episode of We Run This to a Close. Nick and I want to thank everybody for listening. If you love the podcast, please share it with friends or leave a review on iTunes. And remember to follow Nick and I on social media. He's at It's Nick Domingo and I'm at Chris Luminati on Twitter. Or follow us both on Instagram at We Run This underscore pod. Until next time, see everybody out there.